Wielding power is addictive, right? What happens when those who think they wield power, no matter how minuscule and tiny that particular power they wield might be? But what happens when people who've sacrificed everything, including their integrity, to gain that little tiny bit of power? What happens when they realize, hey, I just might be losing this power? Short answer, buckle up, cupcake. It's going to be a bumpy ride. What the heck are you talking about, Randy? I'm talking about all the shenanigans around the Acolyte cancellation. After I made my video mocking people trying to bring back the Acolyte, if you haven't seen it, check it out. It's funny. Well, I think it's funny at any rate. But after I made that video, I was going to leave things alone. But the shenanigans just kept going on and on and on. Everybody's so wrapped up in the finger pointing, name calling, and mudslinging, they're losing sight of the big picture. What's really going on here? That's what I'm here for. I got you covered. Let's get into it. This summer, we got an all new Disney Star Wars series, The Acolyte. Whatever unit of analysis you chose to use, writing, directing, acting, costume design, set design, my areas of interest, aesthetics, visual symbolism, they were all equally atrocious. The Acolyte is arguably one of the worst shows ever made. We're talking my mom's a car level bad. In this day and age, we don't know how many people actually watch any given show. For The Acolyte, the numbers must have been worse than even the critics assumed. Disney very quietly leaked to a friendly source. Yeah, about Acolyte Season 2? Um, we're not going to do it. But we got all this other stuff. Look over here. Pay attention to what we're doing over here. Disney has a problem, though. They've already let the wolf in the door. There was no way activists within and without the company were going to allow this announcement to slide under the radar. From the beginning, starting at the top with Leslie Headland, everybody involved with the Acolyte framed the show as being ideological. The Acolyte was ideological on every conceivable level. The writer, director, showrunner was a gay woman. The cast of the Acolyte got their roles because they represented marginalized voices. The characters they portrayed represented marginalized voices. And the characters in the show did marginalized voice things, allowing marginalized voices around the world to finally be seen and heard in Star Wars. Leslie Headland has said, there is no legitimate criticism of the Acolyte. The only way somebody could criticize the greatest work of art I've ever created is if you're a horrible human being. Immediately, we're talking within hours, almost like they knew this was coming and were prepared. You saw articles popping up in the access media chastising Lucasfilm and Disney. No, you can't do this. You can't cancel the Acolyte. It's a mistake. Amanda Stenberg, the star of The Acolyte, is more than happy to be quoted by these articles claiming the reason why The Acolyte was canceled was because of bigotry and hatred. A number of articles were willing to acknowledge, yeah, The Acolyte, it wasn't a perfect show. It could have used some constructive criticism, not that bigoted, hateful criticism we heard online. The show just needed a safe space that would allow it to grow into its greatness. Disney was motivated by cowardice, not good business sense when it canceled the show. It caved to the hate and bigotry. Who exactly is to be blamed for all this online toxic behavior, the hostility towards marginalized voices? The fans, of course. Just like that, we get an online petition. The fans have spoken. Bring back the acolyte. Disney, Disney, we're talking to you. Social media accounts, who it is alleged have direct ties to individuals within Lucasfilm and Disney, start badgering and screaming at YouTube, shut down these hateful channels now. 
What do these social media accounts with their alleged direct ties to Lucasfilm and Disney use to justify their demands? Why access media articles that accuse the exact same channels? What are the odds of the exact same crimes promoting bigotry and hatred? Again, what a coincidence. Amanda Stenberg decides she needs to release another video, like the first one worked out so well. But if you first don't succeed, try, try again. Amandala whined, oops, I'm editorializing, my bad. Amandala stated, all I ever wanted was to be part of Star Wars, to see myself represented, the wealthy, privileged elite, in Star Wars. However, because I was representing a marginalized voice, wealthy, privileged elite, I was exposed to bigotry and hatred by those whose politics I disagree with. Yeah, I editorialized again. Right on cue, other people pile on with their manifestos and petitions. These dogpilers also claim to speak for the entire fandom when they demand, yes, YouTube, you must shut down these channels for spewing bigotry and hatred. From my perspective, this is where things start to get interesting. YouTube's response? Nah, they're fine. We're not going to take down their videos. Please go away. There's a moment of befuddlement and confusion. The social media account with alleged direct ties to Lucasfilm and Disney clarifies their position. <clears throat> YouTube, buddies, friends, we're not asking you to take down a few videos. No, we would never do that. All we're asking is you take the money away from a few channels. Read between the lines, YouTube. Do your job. Just in case YouTube didn't get the message, social media accounts with alleged direct ties to Lucasfilm Disney include a blatant threat. You know those tactics we like to use against our ideological opponents? Pretty effective, right? Well, if you don't do what we want, we will use those tactics on you. Right on cue, you have the dog pile. People claiming to speak for the entire fandom lashing out at YouTube. No, you have to shut down these channels. These social media accounts with their alleged direct ties to Lucasfilm, Disney, and all the dogpilers in their zeal to shut down these channels that promote bigotry and hatred and in their zeal to go after YouTube who won't shut down these channels that promote bigotry and hatred. They may have violated terms of service and maybe even have gone as far as to violate the law. There's actually more going on here than a bunch of little children throwing temper tantrums because they don't get their way. Once you recognize the patterns, imagine that, Randy talking about patterns, but once you recognize the patterns, recognize the language, you will spot what's going on a mile away. Politics is downstream of culture, but culture is downstream of universities. To understand what's going on here, I'm going to have to talk about something I've mentioned before on this channel, value scrambling. I've been a graduate teaching assistant at two universities and an instructor at one. Whoever teaches the class is responsible for designing the class. As long as you stay within certain guidelines, meet certain requirements, you can do whatever you want. Anybody who's familiar with this channel should recognize I prefer the Socratic method. Others do it differently. You determine what the students read, how they'll be tested, how many points they can earn, is there any extra credit, everything. This is true across the university, across departments, all classes with one exception. And we'll get to that in a minute. There's something you all need to understand. Most professors are incredibly lazy. I had a professor who in the early aughts was still using a syllabus he'd hand typed in the late 70s. First day of the semester, he'd dust off his original copy, put a little sticky note in the corner, handwrite spring 2002, hand it off to a grad student. They'd print off a couple dozen copies, bring them to class. He couldn't even be bothered to bring them himself. 
How do I know it was from the 70s? He hadn't updated the reading list either. Keep that in mind the next time you cut a check to your kid's university. Most professors hate teaching. It takes away from their busy schedules. And in particular, they absolutely hate teaching the intro classes, 101s, 104s. Do you realize how much work is involved in developing a curriculum for one of those classes? And then you have to teach to possibly hundreds of students and don't even talk about the grading. But in the social sciences, psychology, sociology, anthropology, you don't have to worry because the curriculum is already prepared for you. All you need to do, regurgitate it. Now, where that curriculum comes from, don't think about it. Don't worry. Why the social science intro classes? They're part of your basic requirements. Over 90% of all students who come through the university have to take one of these classes. So let me explain to you all how the game's played. First day of class, the professor will stand up and the very first thing they say, this is at high school. We're adults here. We're going to have adult conversations. You're going to hear things that you don't agree with. You're going to hear things that make you uncomfortable. But the number one rule in this class is respect. You will treat each other and the topics that we discuss with respect. And there will be zero tolerance for hatred and bigotry. The professor will then announce, the purpose of this class is to teach you to think like whatever the intro class is for, psychology, sociology, anthropology, whatever. And this profession is built upon the scientific method. Therefore, you can only use accredited research in your arguments. We do not allow anecdotal evidence to be used in our discussions. Simply put, remove the word I. I think, I believe. We're trying to teach you to remove your biases from your thinking. The professor will then get everybody to agree to these rules. Everybody raise your hand if you agree to follow these rules. Okay, okay, now we all agreed. This means anybody who violates one of these rules you're out of here. Now, let me introduce you to our first speaker today. This is Kathy. She's one of our PhD students. She's now going to tell you about her research into witchcraft. Hi, everybody. I'm Kathy. I'm one of the PhD students here in the department. If you major with this, you'll get to know me. I teach a number of the classes. Come by and visit with me. I'm in office 13th on the 13th floor. <laughs> Anywho, my dissertation is on witchcraft. The first thing I did when I started my research, I joined a coven. Now, kind of on the side note, any of you ladies interested in joining a coven? A couple of you I'd really like to see at one of our ceremonies. I'll leave my business card here on the table. You can come talk to me after class to see if witchcraft is for you. Um, excuse me, Kathy, I have a question. Yes, yes, please. How do you maintain your objectivity when you're studying yourself? Professor? Hey, did you just disrespect Kathy's lifestyle? No, no, I'm just, hey, you said I. We don't allow I in this classroom. You will show respect. Okay, okay. Anywho, as I was saying before I was so rudely interrupted, here's a slide of us doing one of our sacrifices. Um, um, Kathy? Another question here. When you say witchcraft, do you mean black witches? Like black magic? Professor, hey, did you just disrespect Kathy again? I just think, hey, we do not allow I think in here. One more outburst from you, you will be expelled from this class. You will fail the class and you'll have to retake the class. You hear me? Oh, okay, okay. Before you all ask, I ain't making this shit up. I sat through this very presentation. I may or may not have been the one who was letting this big mouth get himself in trouble. These classes serve three main purposes. The first one is the most obvious, value scrambling. To get the students so confused, they no longer know right from wrong. Makes it a lot easier to convince them to accept modern values. Their second purpose is to find students like me who for whatever reason, they can't scramble our values. Their goal? 
If you ain't going to change your values, you better keep your big fat cake hole shut. And if you don't, (laughs) we'll get to that. The third, and I would argue the most important goal, is to find the students who are the easiest to persuade, the most malleable, the easiest to indoctrinate. The professor will announce, there is somebody speaking on campus that promotes hatred and bigotry. And they will offer these students extra credit if they come down on Thursday night to help protest. The students who start regularly showing up to these extra credit protest events will be recruited into activist student organizations. Every official student organization has to have a faculty sponsor. The students will begin complaining to the faculty sponsor. Why does the university allow these people to come on campus who spread bigotry and hatred. The professor will tell the students, hey, I'm on your side. I agree with you. But the university, they have to allow people to come and speak no matter how much bigotry and hatred they spread. There's only a couple of ways that the university can prevent them from speaking. One, if they create an unsafe environment for the students. And two, if the students refuse to allow to have them on campus. Oh, wow, that sounds great. How do we go about doing that, faculty advisor? Whoop, whoop. I represent the university. I only advise. You have to decide if you're going to do that or not on your own. Hey, faculty advisor, we just voted we want to do that. How do we go about doing that now? Okay, now that you have decided all on your own without any influence from me, Here's my 12-point plan. Let's go to work. This is where the students learn the most damaging lesson for everybody involved. Facts, reality itself, no longer matter. It's all about creating the right perception. The students learn it's a rigged system. The university doesn't really want to let people who they disagree with come on campus, but they need a justification, a reason to be able to bounce people. Anything will do. Lie, cheat, steal, manufacture an entire incident out of whole cloth, doesn't matter. As long as the university can maintain the facade that they're doing everything to maintain a safe environment for the students, for the children. It always comes back to the bottom line. Universities have to convince parents their campuses are safe. Otherwise, they lose those delicious tuition checks. The universities have just found a way to weaponize that against their enemies. Once the students have their eyes opened, understand the rules of the game, and they know the language, ist, phobe, bigotry, hatred, safe, hostile, they are then told, you're the avant-garde. You're our eyes and ears. It's your job to police the students. Make sure ists and phobes don't bring bigotry and hatred onto campus. And they do. They go out and they identify and tag fellow students. And once that happens, the university moves in. And again, facts, reality are irrelevant. It's all about justification based upon whatever perception they can create. Once you become known to the university and they're labeled, you better keep your head down and definitely your mouth shut, or better yet, you leave campus. Otherwise, you could face violence. And if you resist that violence, you're the one that's in trouble. You brung it on yourself. You have ideas that aren't approved. The students learn they can do whatever they want. They can accuse anybody of anything, regardless of evidence, and that the university will not only egg them on, cheer them on, will hold down their victims while they beat the crap out of them. 18, 19, 20-year-olds suddenly find themselves in a position to where they hold the futures of everybody around them in the palm of their hand. Not only are they fighting the good fight, they have power. Power. (laughs) Me likey. These student activists eventually graduate, and then they spread out into the rest of the world like a virus, where they bring the same mindset. Facts, reality itself are irrelevant. As long as you can have a facade that gives the perception that you're justified in your behaviors, 
you're good. There's a corporation, and let's call it, I don't know, Disney. And let's say that this corporation has an asset. Again, for argument's sake, let's just say this asset's a TV show. And they're worried that this asset, this TV show, may not give as big a return on investment as they would like. This asset just so happens to push the agenda of the activists. The corporation tells the activists, it is your job to protect this asset from bigotry and hatred. An official representative of the corporation runs out to the media and announces to the world, our asset represents our values, pushes our agenda. Anybody who opposes it is a horrible human being promoting bigotry and hatred. Y'all notice the coded language? What some might call dog whistles. Like-minded activists within the access media? Oh, they hear the message loud and clear. They immediately start cranking out article after article, defending the asset. More importantly, defending the ideology of the asset. And then they attack anybody who dares criticize the asset for any reason. Activists with social media accounts, they get the message as well. They're like the students back at the university sent out to patrol the student body. They're looking for any social media accounts that dares question the agenda of the asset. Unfortunately for the corporation, the plan didn't work. Not only did the asset not make the return on investment they wanted, it lost money on a colossal scale. The corporation decided we need to cut our losses, move on. They canceled the asset. No season two. The problem that Disney faces are the activists within the company and those on the outside. All the corporations who embraced activism and their way of doing business are now learning a hard lesson universities learned years ago. When you spin up this type of system, yeah, it can be useful in the short term, but in the long term, there becomes the real question, who's in charge? Who really has the power? Their relationship is purely parasitic. They have become completely dependent upon each other for their continued survival, but they're also slowly killing each other. They're both doomed, but in the meantime, no one knows if the dog's wagging the tail or the tail's wagging the dog. Disney may have canceled their asset, the activists didn't agree, and they're going to bend Disney to their will one way or another. Remember, these are people who've been taught to believe facts, reality itself, don't matter. All they need to do is create enough of a perception, a facade, that will justify behavior. Step one, create the perception that there's this massive backlash to the canceling of the asset. Look, Disney, millions of fans want season two. Step two, create the perception that only those driven by bigotry and hate oppose the asset. And by Disney canceling the asset, they're giving in to bigotry and hate. Step three is an oldie but goodie. Silence all dissent by any means necessary. Create the perception that the asset is universally loved. As I said earlier, what happens next is what I find the most interesting. YouTube told the activists, uh-uh, we ain't taking nobody down. We're not doing your dirty work for you. Go pound sand. I have a question. Do you all honestly believe that YouTube doesn't know who's allegedly behind Rewrite and Ripley? And if that relationship is more than alleged, y'all don't think YouTube hasn't directly been told, yeah, they're our mouthpiece. Whatever the official relationship might be, rewriting Ripley thinks they're Disney's mouthpiece, or they want everybody else to think they're Disney's mouthpiece. When rewriting Ripley demanded YouTube take down channels, they expected YouTube to say, yes, sir, three bags full, consider it done. While we're at it, can we lick your boots too? It never crossed rewriting Ripley's mind that YouTube would refuse their demands. And when they didn't hear back from YouTube, they freaked out. 
had a little temper tantrum. YouTube, we ask you to do something. Are you going to do it or not? The last thing rewriting Ripley expected was YouTube to come back and simply say, no, we're not going to do it. These activists, going all the way back to their college days, believe they have the right to destroy their ideological opponents and that the institutions have an obligation to hold their ideological opponents down while they pummel them into submission. When the institutions say, no, you, you, you handle that on your own, their little minds explode. What the rewriting Ripley's and the Star Wars explained of the world are realizing that power that they thought they had, that they sacrificed everything for, including their integrity, it was all an illusion. And they're seeing that illusion go up in smoke right before their eyes. They're desperately trying to reestablish the world as they knew it. They have to force Disney and YouTube to do what they want. Otherwise, it's over. All the people they've pummeled, the lives they've destroyed over the years, they've made enemies. Enemies with long memories. The giant elephant in the room. Why did YouTube tell these activists, go pound sand? I have a couple theories. One possibility, YouTube went higher up in the food chain at Disney, and they were told, no, we're not asking you to do anything. No, you do whatever you want to do, but no, keep us out of it. The other possibility, YouTube is starting to realize they're a shark and Disney's a goldfish. They don't have to do anything Disney demands. Actually, the shoe's on the other foot. Disney better lick YouTube's boots if they want to get YouTube to do anything. More than likely, it was a combination of possibilities one and two, but I think the real deciding factor was possibility three, Twitter X. The only way you can create a false perception that then can be used to justify behavior is if the entire system, from institutions all the way to the activists, work together in collusion. All it takes is one aspect of the system to break ranks. And then that false perception is revealed to be nothing more than a stack of lies. The moment Elon Musk bought Twitter, he shattered the false perception. Remember I said the entire system is parasitic. They're dependent upon each other for their existence, but they're slowly killing each other. It's doomed. There is a way to break free. Tell the truth. The truth will set you free. Ultimately, that's why YouTube didn't shut down these channels. They already understand it wouldn't have changed anything. Nerd Roddick, Geeks and Gamers, Star Wars Theory, Mahler, Ryan Kennel, That Star Wars Girl, and all the others, they'd still be on X. They'd still be talking about Disney's asset. But now, they would have a legitimate beef with YouTube. What's way more dangerous than a false perception? A real perception. YouTube has zero incentive to do anything for the activists. We won, right? Well, it all depends on what you mean by we. If you're talking free speech, it's been getting the crap kicked out of it here lately. Free speech might have won this round, but here's something for you all to think about. Remember those lazy professors and those people that were more than happy to hand them those pre-prepared curriculum? They're still out there. At any rate, I hope I've given you all something to think about. And until next time, y'all be safe. If y'all are still here, I really appreciate it. While you're at it, why don't you like this video, subscribe to the channel, click that notification bell. You can hear me yammer on about something else next time. And feel free to share this video far and wide. Please like and subscribe. Please leave a comment.